So from this, I take you on to preparing a, a systematic review for publication. In this case, I wish to highlight that a systematic review paper cannot really be a long thesis. It's got to be a short paper, potentially no longer than the size of a randomized trial. And therefore, the writing has got to focus on how a scientific article is constructed with the same structure as that for primary studies. I like to emphasize that the most important part is the abstract, because as we all know, most readers will not read beyond the abstract or, of a published article, including a published systematic review article. The title need to grab the attention. And in the case of systematic review, the term systematic review should appear in the title. Just like in the case of a randomized trial, the design randomized trial must appear in the title. <clears throat> the objective statement in the abstract should clarify the various elements of the research question. And the introduction should emphasize why the systematic review was required, in particular, if no previous reviews exist or new trials have been published. <clears throat> Previous reviews may be assessed using the M-star quality checklist. Okay. The discussion is normally a hard part to write, but here you can compare the findings of your reviews with the findings of previous individual trials or previously published systematic reviews. Now, yesterday we talked about integrity of <coughs> clinical trials. I emphasize that some trials are, re, uh, are retracted because some misconduct or other flaws are found in them. But a lot of trials, even despite the flaws, are not retracted because they are not picked up in systematic review, in the process of peer review, or at present in systematic review, no methodology exists to capture them and remove them from, uh, from the process of systematic reviewing. So here I present to you something uh, entirely new. So I hope those of you who after this ComStack workshop will proceed to undertake any systematic reviews of the trials you are undertaking, will also focus on the aspect of integrity within systematic reviews. Your question should explicitly state that you will be mindful of integrity of the studies included. Retracted studies will obviously be excluded. Those with expression of concern would need to be assessed. Your search and selection strategy, which is step two of a systematic review, could specifically look for whether expression of concern exists about trials. The data extraction stage could involve collecting data that you can use for integrity assessment of the trials included. And your data synthesis can undertake pre-planned integrity-based subgroup analysis of on the same lines that I presented concerning analysis of study quality. And finally, when you undertake grading, evidence should be downgraded if there are integrity concerns. And beware that following publication, if included trials are then subsequently shown to have some integrity flaws, then you should be prepared to issue updates of systematic reviews in light of new integrity concerns identified post publication. I hope from what I have presented, you will be mindful that your own trials will meet the integrity requirements that were presented yesterday and for which on page 88, from page 88, 89 onwards in your handout, you have an international consensus statement concerning 
integrity of clinical trials. So to conclude, the individual randomized trials may be of variable quality. Their results may be imprecise or they may have wide confidence, confidence intervals. Uh, they may be published across the literature, perhaps in different languages, not necessarily captured through searches within just English language. And systematic reviews allow us to put these data together using meta-analysis if appropriate and they allow us to design good trials for ourselves and they also allow us to improve practice based on research so with this i conclude my presentation and i'm happy to take questions both on systematic review as well as randomized control trial integrity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, because it's an online presenter, so I comment we have questions. Okay? So the other question that we have is around three thirty will be for the our guest here. So, sir, are you willing to take our question now? I'm very happy to take questions. I noted that uh, some a colleague raised their hand in uh, Zoom. So perhaps the colleague who raised them, their hand can ask their question if they wish. Please go ahead. Online participants, let's start with the online participants. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharon and uh, Dr. Odoma have, uh, have uh, g given some encouraging comments, so I'm grateful uh, for your feedback. Okay, so Dr. Rath Rathib is asking, what are the contents of a proposal for a systematic review? So I presume you are asking about how to create a protocol or a registration document concerning a systematic review. Uh, in this case, I strongly advise you that just as we use a clinical trial registry for prospectively registering our trial, we should use Prospero, a register for systematic review. And also we can use other platforms for registration. For example, Open Science Framework, uh, an example of which I showed you yesterday concerning registration of the, the International Integrity Consensus. Uh, that platform can also be used for uh, pre-registration of your systematic review proposals. Depending on the size of the systematic review, uh, I believe we should also consider the possibility of publishing the systematic review protocol once it has been registered. And Dr. Maham is highlighting if there is any questions from yesterday, uh, we can cover them and has already put a question to me. I'll read that question out from the chat. The question says, what motivates researchers to falsify results? And what sanctions are available to those who falsify it? So, well, The, the simple answer is researchers are in competition either with each other or are under pressure in order to convince their employers 
or other peers that they are progressing fast, rapidly, or better than the competition. And if this, this puts undue pressure on them, and there are no mechanisms for oversight monitoring or uh, <clears throat> checking to take place as the trials go on, then I think there is a possibility that uh, they might take this easy route out to create, falsify, or fabricate data uh, instead of making the effort to undertake the trial. In the example trial I showed you, you can see that, that undertaking a trial is an effortful uh, activity. It's not just straightforward or easy. So I, I, I think I cannot say more than that concerning motivation. I think there is a responsibility for institutions and organizations to reward uh, those who do well and uh, to create some disincentives for those who don't do well. Um, and I would see the sanctions in those light. I think instead of sanctions for detected misconduct, the focus should be on avoidance of misconduct from the beginning. We should nip the evil in the bud. So the courses of the kind that you are attending now, in my opinion, are far more important than, uh, than thinking about punishment. Uh, th this is the approach I suggest we should consider taking. Then there is a question by Dr. Najmuddin seeking uh, the best duration of a clinical trial. Well, the answer is that it depends entirely on the question and the outcome and the duration of follow-up required. For example, in a cancer trial, the expectation would be that the follow-up should be at least five years. So I don't think there is a single formula that can help define duration of performing a trial. However, I ask you to consider the speed with which COVID vaccination trials took place, you may know that the average size of a properly designed COVID vaccination trial was around 25 to 30,000 randomized people. And these have been randomized very rapidly across many countries and continents in order to produce results rapidly so that within three years, we are where we are today. So please consider that the duration of trial is also linked to how we can collaborate in delivering studies quickly. And for this, I encourage colleagues in the Comstack platform to bring the 50 plus Comstack countries together to undertake trials in a way that they can be performed rapidly and res produce results quickly. Then there is a question by Dr. Imran. Uh, who <clears throat> is talking about uh, is the men is it mandatory to register meta analysis at this time it is not mandatory but as i mentioned yesterday the idea behind attending the workshop that we are in since yesterday and will complete today is not just to do what is the minimum requirement it is for Comstack investigators to show by example to the rest of the world that we are leading in good methodology. So I would very strongly say that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, even though registration is not mandatory, we should regard it as good research practice principle. So we should just automatically always register or pre-register our systematic review projects. I think you also ask about other than Prospero, what platform exists, and uh, Open Science Framework is one such possible platform. The, if, if your systematic review is about, for example, educational intervention, then there are platforms other than Prospero where you can register them. Uh, Co Cochrane, of course, also offers a registration and 
systematic review completion platform. Uh, Dr. Hakim has asked about research with respect to alternative medicine. I would recommend strongly that just because medicine is alternative herbal or non-pharmaceutical, it does not mean that systematic review and randomized trial methodology does not or should not apply to them. I believe that the randomized trial and systematic review methodology applies equally to all different types of interventions. There is a question from uh, Dr. Yunus about post-market surveillance. <clears throat> uh, so look, I have focused on presenting data emerging from randomized trials. So to Dr. Yunus and other colleagues, I emphasize to you that phase four is typically not a randomized study, it's an observational study. Um, I think given perhaps that I'm already overrun my time, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Maham and other colleagues will gladly at another day organize something concerning surveillance where phase four type designs can be specifically uh, discussed and developed. Uh, Dr. Imran <laughs> has asked about study quality assessment. And uh, I think for, uh, for randomized control trial, the risk of bias assessment tool recommended by the Cochrane is now considered the industry standard. Um, however, in some circumstances, it may merit some modifications. So on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, you may or may not wish to use it exactly as it is prepared. Uh, my presentation will be available via Dr. Maham uh, to anybody. And I have missed out on one comment which is concerning the title of my book. Um, I would be grateful if Dr. Maham is also able to just distribute the web link uh, concerning my book. The title of the book is Systematic Reviews to Support Evidence-Based Medicine. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid, and I, I, I give that. One of the speakers you say also wishes to ask a question, Dr. Maham. I'm happy if you have time available. I certainly have time available. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Professor Khalid. This is uh, Mr. Bakhari, and uh, you know, I think that would be wonderful to have you here physically with us. I think you've done an excellent job uh, and, and contributed tremendously to our understanding of systematic reviews and integrity research. Just wanted to uh, highlight one uh, uh, question that perhaps uh, because you are part of this consensus room which produced a document in Egypt, uh, uh, if you are suggesting that the OIC countries. Uh, perhaps can get together in performing collaborative randomized control trials, and certainly they can get together and, and perhaps uh, help each other in conducting uh, systematic reviews and meta analysis as well. But the uh, one uh, limiting factor uh, for researchers in the developing world and the ComStep region is access to literature and literature, comprehensive access to literature uh, at all times. Uh, would it be possible to perhaps suggest at the ComStack level and at your level uh, some kind of a digital uh, access for researchers who should be able to get the unlimited access to published and unpublished literature? I 100% I, I, I agree with you. Uh, just as a randomized control trial, in my opinion, uh, should be a priority for ComStack, systematic reviews and meta analysis of randomized trials should also be a priority for ComStec. Uh, I believe steps are being taken in this direction and Dr. Maham, if she has more information from the head office can potentially make some comments, but certainly I hope she will take this feedback back to senior colleagues within ComStec um, to promote this agenda because within healthcare and biomedical research, it is well established that systematic reviews are at the top of the evidence hierarchy 
And this is what we should be investing in. So I appreciate the comment uh, and the suggestion made. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. There is another question in there. On the chat, there is a question about the minimum size for a clinical trial. So, well, first thing I would say is that the comments I make are not from the regulatory perspective. I imagine some of the presenters and some of colleagues in the workshop uh, perhaps are thinking of the regulatory framework. I believe with respect to regulation, the industry that intends to undertake trial can seek advice from the regulator on sample size uh, before commencing their trial. Uh, so that would be my simple advice to colleagues with respect to regulation. But those outside the regulatory framework, working within academic setting, for example, through universities, well, look, there is no single answer this will depend very much on the topic, the importance of the outcome selected, and the expected effect size that is considered valuable. So it will vary from topic to topic, but also within the same topic, from outcome to outcome. Uh, so I'm afraid I can't give a simple single answer. I can say that in my own clinical field where I have undertaken trials in women's health, I believe that trials of any size smaller than 350 to 500 people will probably produce quite wide confidence intervals. And in this type of situation, clearly planning a prospective meta-analysis, which is to already have a team established of existing trialists who work together to bring the data together in the future when trials are completed should be something uh, uh, of a collaborative good practice within Comstech countries for which, as the comment has been made earlier, Comstech can offer a central platform. I'm happy to take another question or other comments. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's another last question here. Okay. Thank you so much for that very enlightening presentation. I just want to have one comment to pick up in that I had come back at what discussion with some of the panelists. And I want to pick some of your, your opinion as someone has been uh, managing the for quite a number of years. When do you make a decision to undertake a systematic view and meta analysis, for instance, in the absence of uh, adequate primary studies? Should it depend on the sample size, in the few primary studies that you have? Should it depend on the number of studies that are available? That has been like a hard question for us. For us. Okay, Dr. Maham, I apologize due to the sound connection. I could not pick up the question specifically. Are you able to write any key points which I may pick up? That will help me. Okay, thank you, Dr. Maham. I await for the comment to be written. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the extended and the elaborate uh, presentation. My own question is really about the uh, medicine analysis. I'm going to switch it to you. The first one is that uh, what is the average number of the article required to be reviewed for meta analysis? Okay, so your question is. Uh, is there a minimum number of studies yeah. that should be combined for a meta-analysis? So I think the simple answer is any more than one study can be combined in a meta-analysis. So two studies is the minimum required. Uh, but please be aware that just because a systematic review does not have many studies does not necessarily mean that it is a weak systematic review. 
such a systematic review may in fact be highly informative about how future studies should be should be designed and uh, conducted so the value of a systematic review does not just depend on the number of studies it is able to collect thank you very much sir second question is this uh, who are those that are eligible or the caliber of people that should review a meta analysis article so you are asking uh, let me see if i understand this right you are asking if it is possible to uh, evaluate the quality of a published systematic review yes. have i picked that up correct yes, when you submit the paper for review who are those that are eligible the caliber of people that should be allowed to review for Okay, I, I am really sorry. I apologize because of not being able to hear the sound well enough at my end. I couldn't pick up the question, but if it could be written in the chat again, okay. I will be able to address it. But at the moment, I have two questions on the chat which I have so far not addressed, and I'll pick them up. One of this, them is by uh, Dr. Vakas Latif. Uh, and if the question is, what is the difference between randomized clinical trial and randomized controlled trial? So I give you my personal perspective. A randomized controlled trial does not have to happen in biomedicine. It could happen in any other subject, wherever this design is relevant. For example, I understand in agriculture research, it is not uncommon that randomization of plots of lands can be applied to see with different fertilizer for example whether agriculture pro production is higher uh, with respect to the intervention used so there's uh, the randomized control trial simply refers to the design where allocation is randomized whereas the word clinical makes it more specific to healthcare. Uh, with respect to the next question, um, I think I already addressed the issue of minimum number of primary studies. Um, well, then there is another related question. Uh, should the number of studies depend on the sample size of the primary studies? The answer is no. The idea behind systematic review is to collect all the possible studies conducted on a particular topic. Uh, and it should not depend on the sample size of the original primary studies. Of course, how the original primary study will contribute to the meta-analytic result will depend on its sample size. Um, then there is a question, who are the ones qualified to review meta-analysis? Um, I presume you're talking about peer review of a meta-analysis paper. I think the answer then is that people who have the experience of undertaking meta-analysis can be peer reviewers. But look, just as we have a course two days on randomized trials, sure, one day Comstech can organize a course and provide uh, the resources required for undertaking reviews within its platform to facilitate the development and uh, promotion of this type of research within Comstech. Dr. Maham, is there other uh, 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 other question? I have received another uh, comment concerning the link of the book, so I take the liberty to, if you don't mind, add the link on the chat. Uh, let me. It will take me a few seconds to just find it on the internet uh just give me a give me a minute to 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 figure this out and uh here i'm able to provide you the systematic review book link uh within within the within the uh, 
uh, within the chat of Zoom.